Good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry that we are starting a few moments late this morning. We had a technical problem in this room, which just seems to be a constant source of frustration for all of us. Uh, I want to introduce my friend and colleague, Rashid Zatouni, uh, who is the provincial medical health or the provincial radiation specialist at the BC Center for Disease Control. Um, one of the things I find fascinating about Rashid is he has a very long and distinguished career behind him and it's happened in a lot of different places. So um, he was a high commissioner of research at a scientific institute in Algeria for quite a while. Uh, he worked in the United Arab Emirates for 10 years as a, health, as a consulting health physicist. Welcoming Rashid. I'd like to thank the organizers for scheduling this about radio frequency uh, fields and uh, it's devices that use radio frequency, like cell phones, Wi Fi, etc. But recently, issues related to health started to uh, grow. And people now are really concerned about the impact of all these devices on our health and especially on children. So I'll try my best to keep it as simple as possible because I know that technically it's quite complex. But uh, in the end, I think we will have we can we can have also a fruitful discussion about radio frequency devices. Okay. So the outline I'll just briefly talk about radio frequency waves, what they are. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, give you some useful definitions. Also, some of the quantities and units that we use uh, in this field. Uh, one slide about what is electromagnetism, uh, interaction of radio frequency with biological media. The radio frequency uses that we have in, the, in medicine, in the industry, and also the domestic uses of uh, radio frequency waves. I'll talk a little bit also about uh, radio frequency guidelines and safety. And probably more and most important to all of us is what kind of research is being conducted worldwide right now to study the health effects of all these devices that we are exposed to on a daily basis. So what are the radio frequency waves? These are waves that you cannot see, you cannot feel. They are electromagnetic because they carry charges, okay, and you have a magnetic field and electrical field uh, with these waves. They travel at the speed of light. They can travel very long distances, but it depends on, on, on the frequency for the wavelength. And they carry energy, and that's why we use them for telecommunications. That's why cell phones work, is because these waves carry energy to go to receivers, and that the receivers will send it to other places, etc. And that's how you uh, are able to speak to people through the cell phone. Okay, so this is the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, if you look from the left to the right, you'll see that it covers all kinds of radiation. And we have two types of radiation. The first type is what we call non-ionizing, like sunlight, radio frequency waves, uh, uh, and all, uh, all kinds of uh, waves that don't have enough energy to extract electrons from the atoms. And then you have the ionizing, which is what you know as X-rays and gamma rays, etc. And they are called ionizing because when they interact with tissue, they can extract electrons, they can ionize matter, and they can have an effect on the cells, which means on the DNA. So we know a lot about ionizing radiation, but we don't know so much about non-ionizing radiation in their uh, interaction with biological tissue. So some useful definitions. Uh, so radio frequency waves are non-ionizing, and they have a wavelength or a frequency. And this is one of the most important quantities related to this type of uh, radiation. And they can be generated by antennas and then it's just a conductor with uh, a current that fluctuates 
it has a frequency, and that's how we generate uh, these waves. Like if you take your cell phone, it has a small antenna inside, that, and then that's why you can receive and you can send messages, you can talk, and then you can receive also. A wavelength, this is an important aspect uh, of, of the radio frequency wave. A wavelength is just the distance that is covered by one complete cycle, because this is sinusoidal. And the frequency is just the inverse of the wavelength. Uh, actually, the frequency is the velocity divided by the wavelength. So they're related. If you know the velocity, you know the frequency, and vice versa. And then you can have continuous waves, or you can have modulated waves. Okay, continuous waves do not change. They are emitted and they stay with the same power, with the same frequency, etc. Modulated is you change them. And that's why we, uh, we, can, we have cell phone technology. It's because of this modulation. So you can uh, get people to share the frequencies at different times. Okay? So you have three types of uh, modulations. Pulse modulations, where these waves go on and off. Okay? So they're not continuous. Amplitude modulation, where you change the power of the signal. And that's what AM radio is. And uh, frequency modulation, where you change the frequency, and that's FM radio. There are so many quantities uh, that are necessary for a physicist to make any assessment related to this field. But I'm not going to go through all these. I will just talk about the essential ones that have an importance uh, in health. The electric field, whenever you have an, an electrical charge in air, uh, whether it's static or whether it's moving, it creates what we call an electric field. It's like a field of force. It's a force that if there's any charge in space, this electric field is going to push it uh, in a certain direction with uh, uh, a force, and this force is proportional to the electric field. So, and with the electric field, we have what we call the electric, electric field strength, E, and that's one of the components that we measure whenever we assess safety in any environment. And then you have the second one, which is the magnetic field. Now, the magnetic field exists only if charges are moving. If charges are uh, uh, at a stop, at a place without any velocity, we don't have any magnetic field. So magnetic fields are generated by moving electrical charges. For example, naturally, we have an, uh, an, an electromagnetic field because of the sun, the activity in the sun. And in the sun, you have what we call a plasma. And you have a lot of electrons, and electrons are charged. So uh, electromagnetic fields can are created by the sun. When they reach us, they are very weak. But sometimes when you have sunstorms, these magnetic fields can, these electromagnetic fields can be high enough to disrupt the networks, for example. Okay, these are the quantities uh, that we use uh, with electric field strength. We have also magnetic field strength, and we have something that is very important, which is the power density. The power density is the quantity that we measure whenever we do any safety assessment. For example, if we uh, if I want to make an assessment of a Wi-Fi system here, that's the kind of meter I would get. I would get a meter that can, that gives me uh, a reading of the power density, and then I know whether it's safe to be in this room or not. The other quantity which is very important is uh, what we call the SAR, the specific absorption rate, and this is, is uh, especially very important for cell phones because cell phones are, are brought very close to the brain. The waves are absorbed in the brain, okay, and we quantify the amount of energy absorbed in the brain by this quantity called SAR. And if you look at your cell phone or the notice, usually manufacturers give you the value of this SAR. In North America, the SAR should not be more than one watt per kilogram, one to one point one point five uh, watt per kilogram. Actually, right now the new cell phones have much lower SARs. So, what is the power density? If you look at this uh, picture, you have the antenna A on the left, and then as you move away from this radio frequency antenna, the intensity decreases with distance. So. I'll explain what the far field uh, is later. So as you go away from the antenna, the power density decreases, so the amount of energy absorbed in the body decreases. That's why it's better to use uh, a hands-free device when you, talk, uh, when you use your cell phone instead of bringing the cell phone close to your uh, head. 
it doesn't matter that uh, it doesn't I'm sorry, it doesn't mean that there is a risk if you use it that way. But if you want to reduce the risk, you try to keep the cell phone as far far as far as far as possible from your head. And this is where power density is important because it shows you that the the power density decreases by uh, or behaves like one over d squared. That means if you move from one meter to two meters, you reduce the power density by a factor of four. And that's very, very important for safety. Okay, I would not talk a lot about uh, electromagnetism, but I would just say that uh, any electromagnetic field has two components, an electric field and a magnetic field. And if we're a little bit far away from the antenna, these two fields are perpendicular to each other. Uh, and there is a relationship that connects. If, if you measure one, you can measure the, you can uh, calculate the second one. So, all right. Now, what happens when these waves interact with the bio, uh, you know, the human body or any biological uh, medium? They can be reflected, scattered, refracted, or transmitted. And this in this uh, picture, it shows what it means. Reflected. That means they are scattered, but with the same angle. And they come this way and they are scattered and they go away. They are not absorbed. If all waves were scattered, we would not worry at all about these waves because our waves is what's absorbed. They can be scattered. Scattered means at any angle. So these waves, once they hit the surface of the human body or any body of the human, they just are scattered in uh, all places. The, the other thing is if they are absorbed, they can go straight or they can be refracted. That means they are there is a deviation where they, with a reduced angle, but they are still absorbed in the biological uh, medium. Uh, this is also a picture of uh, an antenna and the field, how it propagates in space. If we are too close to the antenna, we say that we are in the near field, there are too many interactions. It's very difficult to measure the, uh, these quantities too close to the antenna because the end, uh, it, at each point of the antenna, there are waves coming. And so when they interact with each other, they can add up or they can subtract. But it's very difficult to characterize the field very close to the antenna. But as you go far away from the antenna, then we have what we call the far field. And then it's uh, much easier to measure and much easier. And usually, when we are exposed to these waves, we are in the far field. The, far, the, the, the near field ends at about one wave. I'll give you an example. If you take a second generation cell phone at 900 megahertz, that, that was the velocity used. Nowadays they use uh, much higher. 9 megahertz corresponds to a wavelength of 30 centimeters. So if you keep your phone 30 centimeters away, you are in, in the far field. But if you get closer, you are in the near field, and there are a lot of interactions, and it's very difficult to assess the, the field and whether you are. Um, exposed to a lot of radiation uh, or not. Okay, the interaction of radio frequency waves with biological system is quantified by three uh, quantities, the induced electric and magnetic. What happens is when we are exposed to these magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields, there are currents that are generated inside the body because of the, of the, of the charges that are moving. So inside, uh, there are currents that are they generated so induced fields. Now, how large are these fields? Usually they're very small, so they should not affect our, uh, our body. They should not affect the functioning of the body. The second is energy absorption. So the, the risk is proportional to how much energy is absorbed. So if we're talking about Wi-Fi, cell phones, etc., normally we are absorbing little energy, not a lot. But if you are standing near, near a radar, like the radar is used uh, uh, for telecommunications or by the military, now these are very high power. And if you stand near a radar, then you, know, you would be exposed to uh, very high levels. And the third thing is, it depends which organs are exposed to these waves. Okay? So some organs uh, dissipate heat much faster and e easier than other organs. So. I'm saying this about heat because one of the major effects of radio frequency waves is the production of heat, temperature elevation uh, inside the body. Uh, in general, we consider that any elevation 
of temperature less than one degree Celsius is not harmful to, to the body. Anything above could have some uh, physiological consequences. Okay, let's look at very quickly where are these devices used. We have three main uh, areas, the industrial applications, medical applications, and the domestic uses. In the industry, mainly there are three uh, applications that are of interest. The industrial microwaves that are used, and usually they use them to dry building materials when they are wet. So that's, I mean, it's the same principle as a, a domestic microwave, just like a microwave we use for food. So a microwave generates high temperature and then it dries. That's what they're using. Induction heating, this is a way to heat uh, any material without contact because of the currents that are generated when these materials are exposed to uh, radio frequency waves, there are currents that are generated and heat, and then so it's a good way to have heat generation without contact with the source. Or dielectric heating, uh, which is the heating of non-conductive materials, and it is used in plastics, for example, uh, uh, rubbers uh, uh, for bonding textiles, etc. There are so many applications. I just gave here uh, the main ones. And if you look at the powers that they use, usually the powers in the, are in the kilowatt range, as opposed to a cell phone, which is a quarter of a watt. So you can imagine the difference between an industrial machine and a device like a cell phone. In medicine, okay, we have uses in medical imaging and therapy. In medical imaging, uh, everybody knows MRI, okay, that's one of the main uh, EMF for electromagnetic uh, fields applications. Uh, MRI uses three types of fields. One is a static field, one is a low power time bearing, and they use a very low power uh, radio frequency field. So what we worry about is, what about patients? When they are uh, examined, in an MRI facility, is there any impact of these waves in the body or not? And this is what an MRI room uh, looks like. Now, workers inside an MRI are not really exposed to uh, any risk. A lot of people think that because they are, the room is shielded, they think that you know we want to protect the workers from these waves. Actually, the shielding in this type of rooms is to avoid getting any into the way, any interfer interfering waves from outside because all the imaging is based on the radio frequency waves and if there's any uh, radio frequency waves from outside it can interfere and then of course it can disrupt the imaging process. So workers can get very close to the uh, patient while the patient is examined without any problem. Uh, except there may be some problem with the magnet because there's a huge magnet there and uh, when we move, when we're very close to this kind of magnet, we can feel dizzy, we can feel nausea, etc. So it happens, that's the, the effect. But it's irreversible. As soon as you, you, you stay away uh, from this machine, then the, that effect is gone. Second is, in interventional cardiology, uh, we use radio frequency waves to destroy tissue that triggers abnormal heart rhythms, which are called arrhythmias. And it's a very, very uh, interesting technique. It's invasive because you have to introduce a catheter. But it's a lot better than the classical surgery. Okay? And it's also called uh, electrophysiology in cardiology. And of course here we generate uh, at the level, at the site where we want to destroy the tissue thermally, uh, temperatures that are generated are above 100 degrees. And that's how you destroy the, the tissue that causes this arrhythmias. And at, at the same time, the higher risk here is not necessarily the radio frequency. This procedure is guided by x rays, fluoroscopic x rays. And usually, the patients are 50 or older, so you don't worry a lot about the dose of case. Also, it's very high, but they are uh, 
uh, accidents can happen where the skin can get a very high x-ray dose and then you can have tissue necrosis, you can have all kinds of things happening to the, to the tissue and it happened. Uh, nowadays the techniques are, are a lot better and these accidents uh, occur much less than in the past. But again, if uh, when we compare the x-ray dose received during a cardiac procedure like this one, if we compare it to chest x-ray, we're talking about millions of times an X-ray, and uh, of course the benefit because of the benefits, we use this technique and, uh, because the patient gets uh, a huge benefit, especially the cardiac patient. Tumor therapy, radiofrequencies are used also to destroy tumoral cell tissue by heat. Here also, temperatures that are generated are in the hundreds and plus. Okay. Uh, and that's uh, another way to treat some tumors without relying on radiation, ionizing radiation. Because, you know, most cancers are treated by uh, ionizing radiation like gamma radiation or high energy x-rays. So, uh, the tumors that can be uh, destroyed by heat uh, are, are, are done by um, radiofrequency waves. Ultrasound was tried also, but it doesn't produce uh, good results like uh, radio frequency. And the physiotherapy, uh, which is uh, uh, one way also to, uh, to, to treat patients. Um, radio frequency, ultrasound, but radio frequency is uh, very common in physiotherapy. Now, domestic uses, I think there's nothing I can teach you about wireless phones, everybody knows. We went from first to fourth generation. But you look at the power, in the nominal power. It used to be higher, one watt or half a watt. Now, uh, more and more, the cell phones have uh, a much lower power, which is very good. And if we continue this way, they might come up with uh, even the much better uh, cell phones at much lower uh, powers. And that's what we want, because the higher the power, the higher the risk. At these powers, I mean, a one, uh, that's a 0 0.125, that's uh, about one-tenth of a watt. So it's very, very low, and that's uh, very good uh, to have this kind of technology. Cell phone base stations, a lot of people question the exposure to cell phone base stations, if they close, etc. Uh, in general, the, the measurements that have been done in many countries show that the exposure to the exposure due to cell, to cell phone base stations is really not that high. Okay? Yeah, you have some hot spots sometimes, but in general, uh, the levels we're exposed to are really very, very low and very low in comparison to the limits. Okay, other domestic refuses, you have a microwave oven that we use at home, and it is normally shielded. If you buy a new one, it's shielded. So the Exposure at half a meter is almost zero, so you don't want to be too close to the microwave oven when you use it. So uh, beyond one half a meter from this microwave oven, you shouldn't be measuring any exposure at all, unless there is a, uh, a leakage. A leakage occurs with years after uh, because of the wear out. Okay, so normally uh, microwave oven should be checked once every two three years to make sure that they do not leak. Uh, other, you know, well, we have all kinds of wireless devices, Bluetooth and um, Wi-Fi, etc. TV uh, broadcast, they use uh, radio frequency wave. Smart meter, which was and still is a very popular subject. <laughs> FM radio and AM radio. So these are the kind of devices that we uh, use on a daily basis. And that means that we're exposed to the waves generated by uh, these devices. Here are some examples of uh, measurements done near cell phone based stations at different distances. And if you look on the right, and I compare that to the uh, international uh, reference levels, which are also uh, the limits. So you can see that we're very, very far from uh, the limits, like 0.0081%, that's uh, very, very low. So in general, the levels we're exposed to around cell phone base stations are low, or let's say relatively low. 
there, I just wanted to show you the ways uh, that uh, we can measure the SAR, the specific absorption rate from a cell phone. So, because we cannot, of course, conduct this experiment on humans, so phantoms have been developed that simulated the human head. And then measurements uh, are done. There are three techniques. One is called the calorimetric te technique, where they measure the heat produced. The second is also in a lab, and uh, we can get the SAR by measuring the electric field inside the head. And uh, this is done through a probe that, uh, that is inserted inside the head. And there is a third method, which is called graphical, because this has been established. If we know the power density, we can predict what kind of specific absorption rate we have. Um, and it depends on the polarization uh, of, of the system. OK, now probably I'll get to the parts that are of uh, more interest to you. Health Canada developed protective guidelines for radio frequency, uh, in general for electromagnetic fields and in particular for radio frequency. And these guidelines are uh, uh, based on one, the short term immediate health, immediate health effects such as stimulation of peripheral nerves or muscles. And when you think muscle, you think about the heart. Okay? So we don't want any electrical. Uh, electrical uh, currents generated in the heart if they're too, too high. Okay. Shock and burns because uh, the, the absorption of these waves in any metal gives rise to a currents and those currents cre uh, create temperature elevation and you can get burned if, you, if you're, for example, near a device that has a high power and you touch a metallic uh, piece. You can get burned because of the uh, electrical currents that are generated. But of course, this is in the industry. You don't find that you know, in the public areas. But in the industry, that's one of the risks. The third one, which is the one we know a lot about, is the elevation of temperature. Okay? At sufficiently high power, uh, and if we're exposed to these uh, high powers, then, yeah, uh, temperature, uh, we can have temperature elevation. And that's what you call the thermal effects. And you can see that these depend on the frequency. Below 100 kilohertz, it's mainly the generation of electrical currents in the body. Uh, shock and burns up to a frequency of 110 megahertz. And temperature elevation is uh, at frequency superior to 100 kilohertz. This is a table showing the differences between countries uh, in guidelines. You can see that at, uh, if I exclude Eastern Europe, Bulgaria, Poland, and Russia, most of the countries in the Western world have the same guidelines, the same limits, uh, except at 900 megahertz. That was some time ago. Uh, uh, the Canada, US, and Japan had slightly higher uh, limits than European countries, for example. But if you look at the higher frequencies, a lot of um, Cell phones now uh, work with 1.8 uh, gigahertz, etc. So the 900 megahertz, that was the second generation, we don't use these phones anymore. So we can say that in the Western world, most of the guidelines, most of the limits are the same. Now, the question is, why in some Eastern countries, the limits are much lower? Do they know something that the rest of the world doesn't know? Are there really any effects that we're not aware of? So when you look at the way they developed these, um, their, their guidelines and defined these limits, they included even headaches, for example, due to these waves. And they also have uh, extensive studies on exposure to radars, especially the Russians. Uh, you know, during the Cold War, the radars played a big role uh, in that Cold War between the West and the East. So uh, they might have had some people exposed to uh, high intensity radars. That's possible. Other than that, the public pressure in these countries apparently also encouraged lowering the limits. Actually, Switzerland is even worse because Switzerland didn't have low much lower. Well, right now it's a big debate at the international level. Uh, and there's a lot of research going on about uh, low level, the uh, 
impact of low level RF fields. For protecting uh, workers in general, we just uh, tell the workers to stay at a certain distance from the device. When they do their work, they do it remotely, and they should never get very close to these machines because these machines have uh, high power. The, the main concern is about workers wearing implanted devices, like um, uh, pacemakers, for example. It was a problem some time ago, but um, now the pacemakers that have been developed are not uh, are protected against any interference from external uh, waves, and uh, technology has evolved, so it's not really any more a problem. Nevertheless, one of the advices that we uh, give to patients wearing pace the pacemakers is to stay is to keep any device at least 30 centimeters away from the pacemaker. Like for example, if the pacemaker is placed on the left, they should use a cell phone on the right and keep a distance of 20 to 30 centimeters between the pacemaker and the cell phone. Um, pregnant workers, it's not uh, really uh, the mother, but the fetus. Uh, there is one limit that we apply. If the fetus is exposed to RF waves, then temperature should never go beyond, uh, temperature increase should never be more than half a degree Celsius. Example, if a patient, if a pregnant patient needs to undergo an MRI examination, and if it's clinically necessary, then the, uh, the technologists there have to make sure, uh, based on how they design that uh, procedure, they have to make sure that the fetus will not uh, have an increase of temperature of more than 0.5% uh, Celsius, 0.5 degrees Celsius. And the exposure limits that are applicable to pregnant workers are the same as those for the public because we're protecting the fetus, we're not protecting the pregnant mother. And we have a series of measures uh, to ensure that patients are protected when they undergo MRI examination, especially vulnerable patients, like people who have cardiovascular problems. Uh, the same thing, we don't want the temperatures to go too high, so they have to, uh, in that procedure, they have to make sure that it's not too long, and that the fields they're exposed to are reasonable, and they should not expose this kind of patients, for example, to high power MRI, because we have MRI, in general, the, the MRI has a power, um, of three Tesla. Tesla is a unit of a magnetic field. Um, but the, uh, there are some MRI machines that use a much higher uh, magnetic field up to a Tesla, and that would require an assessment before exposing these kind of patients to uh, a, high, a high magnetic field. Uh, okay, I already said uh, uh, something about the fetus. And then, in general, for children, we, we don't want the whole body temperature to increase by more than 0.5 uh, degrees Celsius. The head should not go over 38 degrees. The trunk, under 39 degrees. And the extremities, under 40 degrees. And of course, the technologists, they are aware of this. So when they design their procedure, when they set their uh, parameters uh, on the machine. They are aware of this about children, about uh, pregnant patients, and about cardiac patients. In uh, radiofrequency therapy, the, the main worry is the effect on the neighboring organs or the neighboring tissue, because you're treating an area, and you don't want the surrounding tissues to receive also a lot of heat. So here also, they have to use the proper equipment, they have to use the proper procedure to make sure that the surrounding tissues are not affected. But even if it does, these effects are reversible. A few weeks later, the patients recover uh, their function without any problem. Now for the, for the public, what kind of recommendations can we give to the public? Main thing is, Normally, children should avoid using RF devices when they're too young. But if they do, uh, the use has to be limited. 
And for everybody, keep the phone, keep the cell phone as far as possible from the head and use it only when necessary. Do a lot of texting instead of calling, etc. Et I don't think these guidelines uh, everybody knows about. Just to be on the safe side, because uh, it doesn't mean that uh, there's something, uh, any effect, but just in case, you know, you know, if you keep this cell phone far away from your head, you, you have nothing to lose. Uh, on the contrary, you just avoid maybe you're reducing the, the risk. Biological effects of radiofrequency and their impact on human health. So usually low intensity radio frequency, they cause what we call predominantly non-thermal effects. And basically it's generation of electri ele electrical field and magnetic fields inside the body. Now how do they affect the body? If they are very low, they're not affecting anything. If they are high, they could. But in general, if I'm talking about the public in general, the devices that we use cannot generate high currents inside the body. But this is also an area where there is no consensus among scientists, and really the scientific community is divided on this subject on, on whether there are effects or not. There's no evidence, that's the only thing we know, is that there's no evidence based on the studies that have been uh, performed, there's no evidence that low-level radiofrequency waves can cause any again, cancer or uh, any harmful effects. But again, nobody has shown that it's totally safe. So it's debatable. And that's a big debate at the international level. High intensity RF, they cause thermal effects. And we know what is the impact of temperature elevation in the body. For this one, we have enough data and we know. Now, can we reach this kind of temperatures if we use these devices? Of course not. But accidents can happen. Like at work, for example, people who use um, uh, powerful RF sources like radars, etc. It can happen at work for people who use uh, powerful RF devices. But for the public, we don't expect temperature increase of more than one tenth of a degree when you use cell phones or anything. So, so far, no evidence of, how, of adverse health effects at non-thermal uh, RF levels, and this is also debatable uh, because uh, there are a lot of um, uh, people who think uh, there is evidence. And most of the experimental work was done on animals, especially small animals. The problem with the small animals is uh, the, the data we get on animals is very difficult to transfer to human beings because size is very important. When it comes to radio frequency fields, it, it's difficult to transfer the data from mice to human to the human body. And also, uh, you have children who are of smaller sizes as compared to adults, and their skull is thinner than the skull of adults. Etc. There are so many parameters. Okay, okay. I'll go back. So, the health effects that have been uh, under investigation so far, cancer, does RF affect cells, reproductive outcomes? Do they have any uh, effect on our reproductive organs? In utero exposure, any risk to the fetus, cardiovascular effects, peripheral nerve stimulation, effects on cognitive function, does it disturb an individual, uh, if exposed to radiofrequency, do we lose mom memory? Do we have uh, strange behavior, etc.? This is what happened. Now, some of the deficiencies in the studies is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, effects have been observed in animals at high SAR, at high specific absorption rates, which you, which are not applicable to humans because the highest size on the cell phone, and the SAR cell phone, let's say, is around one watt. So. Studies have been done at 5, 10, and uh, higher SARS. Now, how do you, and we know that at higher SARS, of course, there's uh, a higher temperature elevation. So that's difficult to, to, uh, to accept. Um, some of the findings have not been replicated. So that's a problem. If uh, something is not replicated, then scientifically it's difficult to validate. 
Reliability of data. If we look at the studies done on cell phone users, uh, a lot of data are missing. Like, for example, what kind of exposure and what kind of levels they were exposed to. The second thing is, if you study people who have developed brain tumors, and then you look at their use of cell phones and you try to link the exposure, the exposure from cell phones to the brain tumor, it's very difficult in some cases. I'll give you an example. In nuclear medicine, patients undergo brain scans by injection of a radionuclide, like iodine, for example. Well, the risk from that is much, much higher than the iron way. So do we ask these patients also whether they had any uh, procedures before in medicine? Take x-rays, OK? CT scan. A brain scan, for example, delivers a very high dose, relatively high dose, not uh, a dose that could uh, uh, produce a cancer, but it's a high x ray dose in CT. Take uh, similar, similar, kind, similar examinations with CT x rays or radionuclides in nuclear medicine. And these procedures could be the reason for development. So we have to ask also these questions. Have you been exposed to radiation before, where, or to chemicals, etc., etc.? So you have to really fully investigate these patients before you try to make a link between the use of cell phone and the brain tumor that they develop. So the current status is really uh, a question mark for a lot of people. There's no consensus among scientists about the health effects at low level heart exposure. This is important because the public is exposed to a very low level level and we want to know the impact on the public. Some suggest to adopt what we call the precautionary principle which means reducing the limits, the present limits, by a factor of 100 or 1000. And if you do that then it will, it will have a huge impact on our life in general because if these limits are reduced by a factor of 1000 we are really at background level, almost natural. And it, it, it is very difficult to monitor. It is very, very, very difficult to control. OK, uh, very quickly, uh, I have some details about this project. There are five big projects uh, worldwide, most of them in Europe. First one is the EMF project by the World Health Organization, where we have a lot of countries uh, collaborating to uh, develop research in this field. There's a uh, project for the kids, it's called Moby Kids Project. It's an international case control study to study the risk of brain cancer among cell phone uh, users, young cell phone users. Third one is European, it's called the EFRAN uh, Project. Uh, also, it's an extensive study on the uh, exposure of uh, members of the public to RF waves. The Cosmos Project is, is a huge one. And this one will go uh, probably for like 20 or 25 years. And it's also an international cohort study investigating possible death effects from long term use of mobile phones and other wireless technologies. And this fifth one is Seawind. Same thing study of the impact of uh, cell phones and Wi Fi devices on health. And uh, okay, I'm not going to go into too many details, but if anybody is interested, uh, you can uh, maybe the website. And, the websites I really have a lot of information. You can get all the information. So if anybody is interested in this kind of research, yeah, you can find it. And Canada, in Canada, there is only the University of Ottawa who's participating to all this project as an external uh, member outside Europe. I think it is. Yeah. Uh, for example, this one is a very interesting study on, uh, on kids. Sixteen research centers. European and North European, including the University of Ottawa in Canada. And I think the one, uh, let's see, yeah, this is uh, the website uh, of the University of Ottawa for this project. Let's see, this is, this cost we are. And this is a big one. For this project, they have recruited three, so far 300,000 cell phone users in Europe different in six uh, countries, they're going to follow the health of these 300,000 recruits 
for 20 to 30 years. The reason is, all the research that has been done before was done on people who use the cell, the, the cell phones for 10 or 15 years. And apparently there's a question of the latency period. So some people think if something, if there's an impact, it could be after 20 years of use or more. So this is, I think, a project that we should really follow and see. And this is very recent, it just started in 2012. So we can see ourselves 20 years from now looking at the results in 25 years. But they're looking at cancer, benign tumors, neurological and cerebral, cerebral vascular diseases, headaches, and sleep disorders. OK, I'm sorry, it was too long. <laughs> OK, so I'll stop it here. Just to keep, keep some time for questions. Hopefully not too hard to answer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rashid. I actually share an office with Rashid and learn stuff from him all the time. And this, this was really fantastic. Are there any questions in the audience? Yes. Uh, this is, a, I guess, a two-part question. I'll just ask them one part at a time. Um, so with the, the exposure limits in, in Eastern Europe, are those really actually enforced? Is that achievable? They are not enforced. They are on paper. They have been adopted by the parliament and all uh, and the regulatory authorities, but very hard to enforce. No, they are not enforced. So do you think exposure is any lower? It could be. No, it could be lower, uh, for sure, but it could be higher also. But uh, I don't think they have inspection teams that go all around to make sure that these levels are, are really that low. And that's one of the problems, the enforcement. My apologies to our online listeners. I forgot that we are down to a single mic because of technical problems earlier this morning. Um, what Rashid basically said there was that the limits are not enforced in Eastern Europe, and next time I'll run the mic back to him. <laughs> I was going to comment on that, but that, that, that's kind of what I expected. Um, if they were enforced, so maybe that could provide an interesting in comparison between Western and Eastern Europe, yep. comparing countries that are. But definitely, there are areas where they do not allow uh, self Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are areas in Europe uh, free of uh, radio frequency wave. You get no cell phone base stations, no Wi Fi, and that was a choice of a community. Oh, you can have that. And they are this level, yes. If you uh, just avoid all these technologies, yeah, the, the levels can be, uh, can be low. Great. I know we've got two questions from our online listeners. I'll get Jonathan to read them. So Craig Olenberger is asking, what would you say regarding any non-thermal health effects related to interactions between generated electromagnetic fields and those magnetic fields naturally created within the body? Could disrupt disruptions in natural body fields impact body processes which rely on those internal magnetic fields? An example, ionic interactions. Well, the uh, EMF uh, generated by the body are very, very low, and uh, they really are very far from affecting uh, the functions of the different organs. Okay. Yeah. But again, uh, at non thermal levels, there's a lot of research being done, and uh, again, it's really the, community, the scientific community is divided over the effects of. Uh, low level radio frequency, and it's obvious. And in, in the two groups, you have uh, some eminent scientists. It's really, uh, it is very, it is very difficult to say. We, we hope that someone will come up with something, but uh, it's difficult. The, the difficulty is because you cannot experiment on humans. This is the problem. If you compare to ionizing radiation, in ionizing radiation, X rays, gamma rays, alphas. Because of World War II and the atomic bombs, and because of all the accidents, nuclear accidents, radiation accidents, there is enough data now to know exactly what are the effects of ionizing radiation, although there's still a problem with low level radiation levels. But at least we know at what level you know, uh, tumors can develop, etc. Et we don't have that for uh, radio frequency, we don't have any data on humans that could be used to develop new guidelines or to develop uh, new limits.
So this, this may follow up with what you just said. But I guess thinking about non-thermal effects, um, it, it's probably pretty obvious that actually the cumulative exposures that people face now are greater than they have in the past. Um, and I, I wonder if there's any actual measurement data to say how much greater, and if people are also, if, if there's any concern um, about sort of cumulative exposures, let's say from multiple sources, because the, the regulatory paradigm is actually usually device specific. It's not um, uh, exposure uh, derived. Okay, uh, good question. Yeah, two things here. First of all, are the effects cumulative or not? Like, for example, today I use my phone three hours. To work and use it two hours. Does that mean I've been exposed five hours to be today to the very difficult to say? For a simple reason. We don't know whether the cells are affected or not. In ionizing radiation, the effects are cumulative because the effects are on the cells. So the multiplication of modified cells is obvious. So you can get a dose in uh, with x-rays, D1 today and D2 tomorrow, you got D1 plus D2, and then it's cumulative. It's very difficult to say for our waves, uh, because now, second the second part is, what if we're exposed to multiple fields? Here also it's complex, because of, of the nature of the uh, uh, radio frequency waves. When two waves collide, then they add up, then they subtract. I can have a wave that comes with a certain with a certain phase, and then another wave coming with an opposite phase. When they collide, they annihilate, and that's zero exposure. So sometimes having two fields that collide with different phases is good because they reduce the exposure. And like X-rays or gamma rays, when you add two fields, you get uh, the sum of the doses. So that's what makes it really uh, difficult experimental. Any other questions? Oh, I'll put that one online. Um, Craig Olenberger is asking, how would implants of different composition be affected by EMF? Okay, so we have uh, pacemakers, we have metallic implants, okay, and we have all kinds of, of things that can be implanted in the body, especially following trauma, you can have people who have metallic uh, devices inside. So for the pacemakers, I think the problem is easier to solve because there are two things. One, one is the new technologies uh, are such that no interference can occur with the higher waves. Uh, maybe with the old devices there might be a problem. But this, uh, the second thing about pacemakers is just to keep it about uh, 10 to 15 inches away. Keep any device, with a cell phone, a Wi-Fi, from the pacemaker about this distance, and, and that's it. And then, uh, now for the other implants, that's different, because when radio frequency waves are absorbed, they generate currents and then uh, temperature elevation. So this metallic uh, implants can uh, get hot if the exposure is long enough at a higher intensity. So for example, in MRI, uh, uh, one of the questions that patients are asked is if they have any implants before they uh, put them uh, on, on the table for an MRI examination. So yeah, the metallic implants, or workers for example, if they are workers that uh, work with our machines, they have to be careful if they have any implants. And usually they have a safety officer that uh, measures the, the, the fields uh, where the workers stand and then determines whether it can uh, affect the, the worker or not. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we'll wrap it up. So, oh, one more. no, Joseph's got one more. So Craig is asking, again, uh, what proportion of pacemakers still in use are heritage models? without effective shielding, and are people with those devices aware? Very difficult to, to say. <laughs> uh, maybe um, hospitals could uh, answer these questions. Uh, 
But it's really not uh, only a problem of shielding, but it's also the technology itself. Uh, so now they're made in such a way that even if the uh, external uh, fields, uh, even if the patient is exposed to external fields, I think the technology is made such that these fields are uh, are not uh, interfering with the function of the patient. Okay, so, uh, this is how it is uh, nowadays. Okay, now I'm really going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much, Rashid, thank for you. joining us today and, and much sharing pleasure. your expertise in an area we don't actually care much about. And thank you for everyone for coming up. Thank you, Rashid.